Amen. Well, thank you, Lizzie. That was amazing. You all can have a seat. Again, my name is Suzanne Werlein, and in case you don't know who I am, my husband is Pastor Ken, the pastor here at Faith Bridge. And we are both so excited that you are here at the table. This, I know without a doubt, is going to be a meaningful semester for you all in God's Word, because we know God's Word is living and active and it knows just how to pierce each one of our hearts right to our very need. And so I know that this semester will be life changing for all of you. Now, <clears throat> you certainly cannot tell outside, but the calendar says we're in the middle of the fall. <laughs> and I love the fall. There's so many things about the fall that I love. Honestly, I feel like the fall is more like the new year than January is. And I was thinking about this, uh, for the past 40 years of my life, 40 plus if I'm honest, my life has revolved around the school calendar. First as a student and then as a teacher and now as a parent of two school-aged boys, my life has always revolved around the school calendar. So give me January for reflection, but Fall is the start of the new year, if you ask me. Now, one thing I love about the fall is all of the back to school pictures. Don't you just love those first day of school pictures that everybody sends out on Facebook with the cute little preschoolers in their backpacks? And then even I love the pictures of the college students, right? They're like, mom, really? Okay. <laughs> but they send their pictures anyway because they love their mom. And we as mothers are so excited to show these pictures off. In fact, I believe I may have a picture of my two little guys here. Oh, there they are. Now, my boys are now 11 and 14, so, but I think that was the last first day of school photo I may have taken, so <laughs> I was glad to find that. But, Anyway, the fall is a great time. And again, I love these back to school pictures. And what I love most about them is I feel like they are a display of grace. Because you see, before our child goes out and scores an A on a test, before our child goes out to play a game and win or lose, before our child takes one step out of our house and into the school, these pictures are saying, hey, that's my kid, that's my kid, and I am proud of her. I love those pictures. But you know, after we may post these pictures of our children just celebrating them for being our kids and not for any special accomplishment or success, sometimes in our quietest moments, when we're thinking our deepest thoughts, we wonder, would anybody really be that excited about me? I mean, if someone knew me deep down, would they still want to celebrate me or love me or even like me? And so what do we do? We set about to prove our worthiness. We run around filling up every free second of our time with all sorts of important seeming activities and accomplishments, even including spiritual activities and accomplishments to prove to ourselves and to everyone around us, I'm worth something, I matter. But it never quite works in the long run. And the proof is that everywhere we turn, people are burdened with all kinds of insecurities. And we're trapped in all kinds of addictions. Maybe for you, it's an eating disorder or a shopping addiction, or maybe you need social media to feed that approval that you're longing for. I don't know, whatever it may be, you may be able to hold it underwater for a while, like keeping beach balls under the water, but eventually these things will pop up to the surface. And when we do, when they do, we're afraid. We're afraid that then people will know who we really are and will be rejected. But why? Why do we think these things? Why are we living under such a load of fear and shame? 
Why are we so driven to prove ourselves? And how? How can we ever get free from this vicious and unrelenting cycle? Well, I believe that the answer is found for us in the first chapter of Mark. So if you've brought your Bibles today, I want to encourage you to open them and find the first chapter of Mark. It's Matthew, Mark. It's the second gospel. And while you're turning there, I'll just give you a little bit of background about Mark. Of course, this semester, in case you hadn't heard, you will be studying the book of Mark. And as you begin to read this book, you'll notice that Mark tends to be a man of action rather than words. His book is the shortest of all of the four gospels because he likes to get straight to the point and keep things moving. So we shouldn't be too surprised when we see that he completely skips over Jesus' birth and childhood and zeroes in straight to his very first day in public ministry. Let's start reading in verse 9. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Immediately, coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opening, and a voice came out of heaven saying, You are my beloved son. In you, I am well pleased. Well, let me just stop right here and, and first of all say that Jesus did not need to be baptized for his own sin because he didn't have any. But instead, he was baptized so that he could identify with us in our sin. But then, can you believe what happens? The God of heaven and earth tears back the sky, sends down his Holy Spirit on Jesus, and then he loudly and proudly proclaims to everyone around, this is my son, I love him, and I am so proud of him. Now remember, at this point, Jesus had just started off his official ministry. In fact, his whole life had been in preparation for this time. But at this point, he had not performed a single miracle or preached a single sermon. He hadn't died on the cross. He hadn't risen the third day. And God the Father knows that all of this is to come, but he does not wait to shout his praise. Instead, he loudly and he proudly proclaims his joy and pleasure over his son, even before Jesus takes one step out of the water and into his ministry. And then resting in this full knowledge of the Father's love for him, Jesus is able to move forward to fulfill the great and costly call that the Father has put on his life. Friends, do you realize that when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, Jesus says in John 17 that our lives are joined with his. And that means that everything that Christ has done counts for us. It also says in that same passage that Jesus says, praying to his father, he says, you have loved them just as you love me. Do you hear that? So when God says, this is my beloved child, he's not just talking to Jesus, he can say the very same thing to each of you today. You are his beloved child. Because of Christ, you don't have to strive for God's love. You already have it. We don't have to prove anything to God because Jesus proved himself for us on the cross. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We can be free from the trap of trying to earn God's favor and trying to prove our worth to others because we are loved by the Father. Now, I can hear some of you saying, um, yeah, that's good for all these other ladies around here, but uh, you don't know me. You don't know where I've been. You don't know what I've done. You don't know my background. I am a mess, and I know it. And I am convinced that God could not love me. But friend, if that's you, I'd just have to stop you right there and say no. 
That's not true. I am convinced that God loves you. God loves even the worst of sinners. And just how do I know that God loves you? Because God didn't just say that he loved you. He took action to show that he loves you. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait until we cleaned ourselves up. He came in our mess. You know, one of my very favorite authors of all times lived in the late 1800s to the early 1900s, and her name was Hannah Whitall Smith. Now, Hannah had such a profound impact on so many around her in her day, helping them to understand the love and character of God. And in one of her books, she tells the story of a young man who had lived a wild and crazy life full of sin until he was converted to Christianity. And someone asked him, because looking at his life after Christ, he was a godly man making this huge impact for Christ. And so someone asked him about his conversion and how it came about. And he said, well... I did my part, and God did his. And his friend said, well, what was your part, and what was God's part? And he said, my part was to run as far and as fast away from God as I possibly could, and God's job was to follow me until he caught me. Isn't that beautiful? I love it. I love that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. That isn't just a nice little thought. That was his mission. I love the words of the song that Lizzie just led us in called Reckless Love. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. It chases me down. It fights till I'm found. It leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. You know, every time I hear that song, I think of the scene in Sleeping Beauty where the prince is climbing the mountains and scaling the cliffs, slashing his sword left and right, cutting out the thorny bushes in his way, slicing up all the obstacles, and finally killing the fire-breathing dragon just so he can get to his beloved in the tower, Sleeping Beauty. And do you realize that that is just what Jesus did for you and me? We were like Sleeping Beauty. We were living under a terrible curse, except our curse was far worse than a hundred year long nap. We weren't just sleeping peacefully up in a tower somewhere. The Bible says that we were completely and totally dead in our trespasses until our Savior fought his way to us. And he didn't fight his way to us because we'd done anything worthy of it. We were just lying there dead. We couldn't do anything. But he came to us because he loves us, because we are his beloved. And so that's the first thing I want you to clearly see in our text today. The Father loves us. All right, so what happens after God pulls back the curtains of heaven and proclaims his great love for his son? Does he immediately send him out to heal the sick or to give sight to the blind or preach a sermon to the masses? Is it time for him to feed the 5,000? Nope, not yet. Let's look at our passage again, starting in verse 12. Immediately, the Spirit impelled him to go out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels were ministering to him. Okay, so this is interesting. I would have imagined that Jesus, being full of the Holy Spirit and strengthened by his Father's words, would have just gone marching right out to save people. But that wasn't the Father's plan. 
the first order of business for Jesus was to go into the desert with a pack of wild animals and fight a battle against the devil. Now, at this point, we're going to have to flip back to the book of Matthew. So turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 4, or you can just look on the screens. But it'll give us a little bit more insight into what this battle looked like. Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 1. And then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After he had fasted for 40 days, he became hungry. And the tempter said, If you are the Son of God, then command that these stones become bread. But Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand up on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it's written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so you will not strike your foot against a stone. But Jesus said to him, On the other hand, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Now, Satan is very persistent. So he tries a third time, starting in verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to, to him, all of these things I'll give to you if you would just fall down and worship me. And then Jesus had it, and he said, Go, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then the devil left him, and behold, the angels came and began to minister to him. Now notice that Satan starts off by saying, If you are the son of God, Now, Satan is highly aware of who Jesus is. In fact, he has been forced for all of eternity, past and future, to bow down and recognize Jesus as being God's son. Okay? He also knows just what the father had said at the baptism. And, of course, he cleverly leaves out one important word when he reminds Jesus of what God has said. Do you know what that word is? It's beloved. It's the word beloved. Remember the father had said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Because one of Satan's greatest tactics is to plant doubts in our minds about the love and goodness of God. Does he really love you, Jesus? I mean, because if he does, he's not taking very good care of you. I mean, look at you. You haven't eaten for 40 days. Obviously, God's not providing for you. So why don't you just take things into your own hands and provide for yourself? Does any of that sound familiar? Satan is not creative, but he is tenacious. He has been running this same play for ages. Satan loves to cause us to question the love and goodness of God. Because he knows that that will drive us to act independently from God and lead us away from God. And so if you're taking notes, jot this second point down. After we see that the Father loves us, we see that the enemy lies to us. Theologian and author Henry Nouwen restates the lies of the enemy this way. You are what you do. You are what others say about you, and you are what you have. You are what you do. Jesus, show us that you are God's son. I thought you were the creator of the universe. Surely you can do a simple thing like changing a stone into a loaf of bread. If you're God's son, prove it. You are what others say about you. Look, Jesus, if you just swan dive off of the top of this temple here and you land right on your feet, everyone will be talking about you. You'll have huge crowds following you. That is what you want, isn't it? 
Number three, you are what you have. All right, Jesus, I'll make a deal with you. Just bow down and worship me, and I'll hand over all these kingdoms to you. Because why should you have to go to the cross when I can give you the kingdoms and the glory right now? You know that's all you're really after. Well, I don't know about you, but over the years, I have bought into these lies from time to time. One of the most challenging times for me was becoming a mom. I'd always wanted to be a mom. I'd been a teacher, so I knew how to handle kids. But friends, I was completely clueless about what to do with babies. And I was completely blindsided by the identity crisis that was to come in my life. Prior to meeting Ken, I had served in full-time ministry with Campus Crusade for Christ. And I'd had the opportunity, amazing opportunities, to travel all over the world singing and sharing the gospel with people from all kinds of backgrounds and all kinds of nationalities. And I loved it. And I was affirmed by others as I did it. Well, I figured that marrying a pastor would just keep that ministry train going. And for a while, it did. After marrying Ken, I got to teach music in a Title I school in Klein, and I absolutely loved it. And I knew what I was doing was important, and everyone around me seemed to think I was doing a great job at it, so I was happy. And then God answered my prayers, and he let me become a mom. So I quit my job full time to stay home with my son. Well, it didn't take too long before I realized I didn't know what in the world I was doing. Ken was gone at work all day, and most of my friends still worked or had older children, so I was lonely and isolated. Everything that I had previously found my worth in was gone. And I had bought into the lie, you are what you do. So when my life changed and those things were naturally removed from my life, I didn't know who I was anymore. And I began to question my worth. Well, not too many years later, we discovered that one of our sons has a couple of special needs. Chief among them, a large measure of ADHD. And I love my son deeply, and he has grown in so many amazing ways since that time. But those early years before his diagnosis were just plain hard. My son would act out in public loudly and very dramatically at the most inopportune times, and I didn't know what in the world was going on. I did my best to help him through these outbursts, but <clears throat> Those around me didn't have the slightest idea what we were going through, and they would glare at me. And then some of his preschool teachers even questioned my parenting skills. And I felt like an utter failure. It was at this time I found myself wrestling with the lie, you are what others say about you. And I'd always found such worth in people's respect and admiration of me. And so when it was gone, I began feeling like I was a failure. A short time later, we realized that the very best fit for our son's focus issues would be a private school with very small classes. We're talking five to one ratio. And as it turned out, the very best school for our son was all the way across town in downtown Houston. And so I can remember in those early years, driving I-45 hour after hour with tears flooding my eyes on a number of occasions. You see, I had thought that when our son was in kindergarten, then I'd finally get time to myself. And this time, I'd bought into the lie that you are what you have, free time, peace, quiet. And then when it was taken from me, I had just about had it. But do you know what? It was there in my personal wilderness that God met me. 
In utter exhaustion and complete desperation, I began clinging to the word of God like my life depended on it. I started using the many hours in the car as a personal seminary class, listening to sermon after sermon and filling my mind up with the truth of God's word. And then I would crank up the praise music and I would sing at the top of my voice to the Lord. And then when I got home, I'd pull out my journal and I would pour out my heart to Jesus. You know, I grew to where I actually began to look forward to those hours in the car. It became for me a sanctuary where I truly would meet with God. And guess what? Eight years later, I am still driving every day back and forth. But you know what? I'm not teaching at a Title I school or working in full-time ministry. I'm not traveling the world singing and telling everyone about Jesus. But friends, I am fulfilled. And I look forward to those hours of time that I get with my son every day in the car. It's a precious time for me now, a time of bonding and a time of discipleship where I am intentionally using this time to teach my son how to read the Bible for himself, how to pray, how to journal. Thanks be to God. Now the key to breaking the cycle of lies that the enemy was bombarding me with was, and to move on to spiritual victory and growth was getting to know and believe and proclaim the word of God. If we go back to Matthew's version of this text, we see that that's exactly what Jesus is doing. Every time Satan throws out a lie, Jesus combats the lie with God's truth. And then Satan hits him again with a new lie, and Jesus stands firm in the word of God. And finally, Satan slinks away, defeated. And that is point number three. The word of God liberates us. God loves us. The enemy lies to us. But the word of God liberates us. And that is why it is so great that you all have chosen to come to this Bible study where you are going to read and learn and believe and stand firm in the word of God. Because you know what? We've been lied to for far too long. And we have bought in to that lie, living as slaves under those lies for far too long. It is time for us to be set free. The British preacher Martin Lloyd-Jones tells a story that I think illustrates this pretty well. He says, suppose there was a city that was in captivity for hundreds of years. Whenever the nationals told a slave to do something in particular, he'd better do it or he would be killed. So there were always two groups of people, the oppressors and the slaves. And for hundreds of years, the oppressors would say, you do this, do that. And the slaves would say, yes, sir, right away, sir. But suppose a new king came in and conquered the land and announced to everyone that they're free. The slaves were no longer subject to the powers that once held them. That would be good news for the slaves. But you know what would happen? For months and years to come, probably, when a former slave saw his former master approaching, he'd probably stand at the ready, listening at attention for the commands. And the former oppressor might walk up and say, you do this, you do that. But why? Because we don't change years and years of pattern thinking overnight. But friends, this paints a beautiful picture of our situation in light of Christ's victory. If we are in Christ, we are free people. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Christ has finished the work. Yet we often forget this. We are accused daily of our sin, of our inabilities, and we're seduced continually into trying harder and harder to be our own saviors and lords. These lies of Satan continually come at us and we forget 
who we are. We forget that we are daughters of the king. We are his beloved. We need to remember who we are and remind one another week after week as we join together and pray for God's grace continually to open our eyes and to help us to stand firm in our freedom. It is hard to live in our new identity as daughters of the king, but just imagine if we could do it, ladies. Imagine if this room of some somewhat 300 of us would go charging out week after week, not seeking the approval of people or friends or Facebook, but rather we were simply to go charging out of here, confident, ready to live freely in the confidence of our Father's love for us. That's what I want, and that is what I want for you. And that is what I'm praying will come from this group as you journey together reading God's word this fall. May God richly bless you as you set aside time every week to hear the word of God. And may the Holy Spirit give you all you need to believe it and to stand firm in it. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you that you tell us we are your beloved. We thank you that you sent your son Jesus to seek us out when we were lost and dead in our sin. Not so you could come and accuse us, but so you could come and show your love to us and give us new life. Oh, Lord, the enemy whispers loudly into our ears, and he is persistent. And our world around us, our culture, just confirms you are what you do. You are what other people think. You are what you have. I pray in Jesus' name that as we study your word, we would be like Jesus and stand firm in the truth. Resist the lies of the enemy and stand firm in the truth. Thank you, God, that we are your beloved. Thank you, God, that we have you on our side. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.